Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, this is the first lecture of Globalization and Culture. We must begin at the beginning by defining what is globalization. As I said in my introductory lecture, while globalization is a buzzword which is on everyone's lips, not many people are clear about what we mean by globalization. Let us together explore some of the definitions of globalization, which have been offered by some leading theorists of globalization from different uh, disciplines, geographers, sociologists, uh, philosophers, uh, media studies scholars, culture studies scholars and so on. Let us look at what we understand by globalization. Uh, globalization has been defined by some as a phase shift occurring in the last decade of the 20th century and it includes different aspects including the economic, political, social and cultural. This has happened because uh, this has led to some as some believe the erosion of the nation state system. Uh, the denationalization of markets, politics, legal systems and integration of economies. On the other hand, there is the rise of transnational organizations and corporations, the machinations of capitalism and the imbrication of economic with the cultural. Uh, Let us look at some of the definitions. So, Imre Zeman defines it, calls it the name that has been given to the social, economic and political processes that have taken together, produced the characteristic conditions of contemporary existence. Walter Mignolo, another leading theorist, calls it the geopolitical imaginary that lays claims to the homogeneity of the planet from above, economically, politically and culturally. So, the first aspect of globalization is communicational. Anthony Giddens calls it the intensification of worldwide social relations which link distant localities in such a way that local happenings are shaped by events occurring many miles away. Roland Robertson calls it the compression of the world and the intensification of the consciousness of the world as a whole into a single place. The geographer David Harvey used the memorable phrase time space compression to describe the present global process. Ulf Hunner's called it a matter of increasing long distance interconnectedness at least across national boundaries, preferably between continents as well. And Tomlinson called it complex connectivity and stretching of social relations across distance leading to interdependence. So, the idea is that the world is becoming a single social and cultural setting, a global unicity and the emphasis, the key words in uh, these definitions of globalization which focus on its communicational aspects are uh, intensification of worldwide social relations, compression of the world, time space compression long distance interconnectedness, complex connectivity. If we were to deconstruct each of these definitions, we would find that 
connectivity which most people understand as the, the uh, characteristic feature of contemporary globalization is not, it is an extremely complex phenomena. Oh, what does Giddens mean when, when he says it leads to the intensification of worldwide social relations which link distant localities? Uh, that local happenings are shaped by events occurring many miles away. Think of the last um, uh, uh, bust, the, the boom and the bust in software industry in Bangalore and the crashing of the US e economy and what it did to the Indian economy because as a result of uh, the, the situation in uh, US, people in India lost their jobs. So as someone, uh, as um, they s in a cliched manner, as they say, when Wall Street sneezes, uh, the rest of the world develops a fever. So this is what he means by saying, local happenings are shaped by events occurring many miles away. And Robertson's idea of the compression of the world is quite different from uh, it, it's taken over by David Harvey, the intensification of the consciousness of the world. So uh, there's a suggestion that it's not just uh, a, a territorial compression, but also leads to an intensification of the consciousness of the world. So people began, begin to think of the world as a single place. What does it mean, thinking of the world as a single place? Is there any such consciousness where think of, we think of the world as a single place? And then we come to David Harvey's idea of time-space compression. Uh, what is this, uh, this f uh, phrase, time-space compression, which has entered the vocabulary of theories of globalization? What does uh, Harvey mean by this? Uh, obviously, one is talking about compression of space as a result in the improvement of uh, transportation and communication technologies. But how does it lead to the compression of time? What does David Harvey mean by this? What Harvey means is that through the shrink shrinking of distances, the evolutionary scale or the evolutionary logic with which in which societies were arranged in the past uh, has now ended because all societies now inhabit the same time frame. From Harvey, we move on to uh, Ulf Arnes's notion of long distance connectedness, which is how he defines globalization. Yes, connectedness has not been a new thing. People have been connected in the past but what is new about the present communicational aspect of globalization is that it connects people who are remote, who, who are located at this long distance from one another. So this increase and the intensification of uh, co communication between pe people who are dispersed across the world is what Hunters means by long distance interconnectedness, at least across national boundaries, preferably between continents as well. And then we come to uh, the other side of connectivity, which the, uh, the former scholars and theorists that I have referred to also, ref also mention, is the notion of complex connectivity, yes, Globalization has brought people together, it has shrunk distances, brought people together and led to an unprecedented degree of connectedness. But does it mean that connectivity is a simple matter? Does it really uh, lead to the perception of the world of a sing as a single place, the production of a single, single world consciousness? Or is the connectivity more complex than that? If we were to look at, if we were to uh, look at the idea of connectivity more carefully, we'd find that not everyone in the world is connected, and 
the degree of connectedness uh, depends on where in the world you are located, uh, depending on your uh, geographical location, uh, your economic position, your technological capabilities, your class, gender, uh, ethnicity. S for instance, in this campus from where I am speaking to you is, uh, is a state of the art, uh, offers state of the art facilities in terms of connectivity. One can uh, the entire campus is wired, one, one has Wi-Fi wherever you go in the campus, one can communicate with anyone across the world from this classroom where I'm sitting, it's a virtual classroom and I can hold uh, not just uh, conferences but I can engage a joint class with my, with a faculty in any part of the world. Virtually it's possible for me to do that. Lit Literally, it's possible for me to do that. But as you step outside the campus, there is a uh, inhabited by uh, tribal people just across the boundary of the campus. And one would find that not just access to new communication technologies, but even electricity and water are luxuries that the people inhabiting those villages are not able to have access to. So connectivity uh, is a very complex matter even in the present global process and as Doreen Massey, another geographer calls it, she calls it the complex geometry of time-space compression building on David Harvey's notion of time-space compression. The other aspect of globalization is economic. Some have defined globalization as the rise of global capitalism. And they call it a qualitatively new era of capitalist development, in, uh, which, which some date back to 500 years ago. And they say that in, the, in this late stage of capitalism, there is a complete integration of the world into the capitalist system a complete integration of the non-West in the West. Uh, another connected feature of the rise of global, uh, global capitalism or a uh, manifestation of the rise of global, global capitalism is the transnationalization of organizational functions. So today, uh, 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 organization, organi organizational functions are geographically dispersed with the, the central functions remaining with uh, the core nations and the more peripheral functions like production, for instance, have been shifted entirely to the periphery or to the less developed parts of the world. So this transnationalization of production and the birth of the transnational corporation uh, leads to a globalization of the economy, among other things. And um, yet we cannot say that the economic aspects of globalization can be read in isolation from the cultural aspects because as Fre Frederick Jameson rightly put it, globalization as we understand it today is a becoming economic of the cultural and becoming cultural of the economic. After this, we move to the political aspects of globalization. What does globalization mean in political terms? In, very, uh, in a very lay understanding of the term, and um, which is, uh, which is uh, being uh, voiced at the highest levels is a fears about the demise of the nation, nation state and these anxieties about the impending extinction of the nation state, the idea that the nation state would become an obsolete category in the new global process come from the diminishing of the sovereignty of the nation state in the present era of globalization. And this uh, 
diminishing of its authority results from two reasons. The nation state seems to be threatened from both within and without. From without, it's threatened because of the rising power of the transnational corporations. And from within, with to the, uh, due to the birth of micro-nationalist movements. So because of the increasing clout of the transnational corporations, the state has relatively less or always, almost no authority in the running of the economy and thereby it also loses its political power because of the loss of its economic power. From the political, I come to the next question, which is, which is globalization, is globalization an entirely new process? Is it something uh, which began very recently, as some believe? Or is globalization just old wine in a new bottle? Theorists of globalization seem to be divided over when globalization began. So on one hand, we have a group of theorists who look at globalization as a complete, the present globalization as a complete rupture from the past in the sense that they think that this globalization is entirely, it's entire, is an entirely new phenomena. Which, and, uh, the, which was not present any, any time in the past. On the other hand, we have a group of scholars and theorists and thinkers who believe that the present global, the, the global, present global pre process is merely a continuation of former global, former translocal movements, and uh, though it's different in degree and kind. The, and some have called it, for this reason, some such as Arjun Apadurai has called it the new global process to distinguish it from former earlier global processes. Now, when do we date globalization? In the common understanding, uh, the present wave of globalization is said to have begun in, in uh, the la end of the uh, last decade of the 19th in 20th century, to be more precise, if one needs a precise date, in sometime in 89, with the dissolution of the former USSR and the formation of the European Union. So that's the uh, understanding that this is when the current wave of globalization began. But if we go back to the history of globalization, uh, there are others, for instance, uh, who's, who would place it to the end of the Second World War and the formation of transnational organizations uh, such as the UN um, and so on. S this is the second understanding. And Eric Hubsbaum uh, who would place it at in the 19th century in 1860s with, uh, uh, with him relating it to the invention of new communication technologies which connected people across distances, such as invention of the telephone, the telegraph, and the railways. The most uh, uh, controversial and uh, influential definition uh, idea of, uh, of the origins of globalization, particularly in its economic aspects, is that of Immanuel Wallerstein who, in his world system theory, uh, suggested, uh, or rather argued, that the, uh, the present movement, the present glo global movement, is, a, is really a movement of capital, which began more than 500 years ago with, uh, with, the, uh, with the integration, with colonization, and the integration of the non-Western world into the capitalist system. And according to Wallerstein, this process has uh, reached its culmination with the inter integration of the entire, almost the entire world into the capitalist system. But it's not a new idea because he sees continuity rather than rupture between the old global process and the 
between the old global wave and the present global wave differing only in degrees. We, we, we might want to go back to even earlier histories of globalization as these examples show. Uh, here we see the, uh, an 800 year old Indian hospice in Jerusalem, which is about in the 12th century AD and apparently Baba Farid, uh, the great seer and poet was believed to have taken shelter here, uh, had stayed here. And we, on the other hand, we have the, uh, an illustration of the Hansanama, a uh, dastan which traveled from Persia to India, uh, from Punjab, from North India uh, to Delhi and the rest of India as early as the 10th century, uh, according to some 6th century AD. And these figures show that these histories go back even earlier. For instance, we have Marco Polo's manuscript, which talks about pepper harvest in Malabar. And we, talk, we know about the trade route between the coast of Malabar and the rest of the world in the 12th century through the works of the writer Mitab Ghosh. And in the recent uh, archaeological discovery has, has revealed, has uncovered this Indo-Greek city in Swat dating back to the 2nd century BC. So uh, now we'd we can conclude with asking the question, the idea uh, we might, after looking at the examples we've seen so far, it would be a mistake to call globalization an entirely new process because as we've seen, there, were, there is ample evidence of contact and communication between different parts of the world dating back to prehistoric times. Uh, I would like to conclude by asking you the question, is the global village a myth or reality? We talk about global village following Marshall McLuhan, the great media theorist, who's, who's, who, 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 who's uh, proposed or who surmised that the new um, electronic independence recreates the world in the image of a global village. So that's a question I'd like to leave you with. Is the world, has the world become a single place in the present wave of, with the pres in the present phase of globalization? Do we all live in a single world? I'd like you to ask that question. In the, if we really look at the world around us, we'd find that the world is neither one because the world is, there are parts of the world which are still not connected. There are people in the world who are still not connected, who are not part of the wired world. So since they are not connected, they're not, they have, they are not connected to the world. They cannot be part of the global village. Secondly, if we try to uh, de uh, deconstruct the idea of a village, what it entails, what it means, and if we were to define village as a close-knit community based on uh, personal ties and relationships, uh, we would say that the present global village, if there is one, is not a village in that sense because the way people are connected to one another is through external forces, through uh, organizations rather than sharing a one-to-one -one contact as people do in a village, nor do they experience a sense of community in the sense that villages do. They might be communities, new global communities based on interests, based on uh, sharing of ideas and so on, but they cannot replicate the close-knit uh, relationships, the primordial relationships of a real village. I'm not saying whether this is a good thing or not bad thing, but what I'm saying is that the world is neither one nor is it a village. So this aspect or of globalization is easily explained if we look at the twin 
uh, twin uh, dimensions of globalization. So on one hand, we have uh, globalization. We have it has led to homogenization of the planet, and on the other hand, the fragmentation of the whole world. So initially, when uh, with uh, with the onslaught of gl globalization, people, particularly not only in the less developed parts of the world, but also in the more developed parts of the world, uh, were uh, voiced their apprehensions, their anxieties about the world becoming a single place, about the panorama of sameness through the homogenizing wave of globalization that had swept the world. Uh, but their fears appear to be ha to have been unfounded because the present wave of globalization revealed not just homogenization, but a con uh, counter movement which one may call fragmentation. So on one hand we have a homogenized homogenizing wave which creates an un which creates the undifferentiated space of globalization producing, as some believe, a global monoculture, a global monoculture which is often equated with a single capitalist commodified culture and seen as a threat to local cultures and identities. And for some, mis for, for some uh, mistaken reason, this culture is identified with American monoculture. On the other hand, globalization has led to increasing fragmentation of the world and increasing recognition of difference. So if there is a homogenization of the planet from above, there is also a corresponding fragmentation of the world from below. On one hand is a Mac world, on the other is jihad, because globalization also means the paradoxical return of narrow linguistic, ethnic, and tribal identities. Homogenization, however, does not lead to global monocultural invasion. Instead, it has led to increasing visibility of local cultures through improved circulation. So two important books which uh, emerged, uh, which appeared in the 80s rather than the 90s after, uh, after the formal uh, announcement of globalization. The first book by Benjamin ba Barber uh, uh, is by Benjamin ba Barber, which is called Mac World versus Jihad, and another one is called Samuel uh, Clash of Civilizations by Samuel Huntington. So these two scholars, uh, Samuel Huntington is uh, the first one who anticipated uh, in his book, in his highly controversial book, that the world will be realigned in the 21st century along lines of religion, ethnicity and culture rather than, uh, rather than nations as it was in the past. And Barber called uh, the, this homogenized world as a Mac world and the fragmented world which I just spoke about as jihad. So the final uh, question f that I would like to leave you with before I conclude is, does interdependence and connectivity in the present global phase lead to a single global culture, as Tomlinson puts it? The answer is global connectivity does not lead to globalization in other spheres. It leads to greater connectivity and proximity, and probably a transformation of locality rather than uh, the production of a single global culture. Thank you.